Thanks. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome back to class. I feel like our last class, which was on Tuesday, happened a couple of years ago. And I think today, as you know, we'll be considering mental health. And all of us have a new perspective, I think, after these last two or three days on issues of stress, anxiety, disappointment, discouragement, and many other feelings that we've had. Um, it's kind of a remarkable thing to be looking at the pandemic and looking at the political terrain and changes and the intersection of the election and the pandemic. Um, the pandemic, as I think all of you know, is surging. And in some ways, some of the data and attention to the pandemic were displaced over these last few days by the election. But yesterday was the highest day of new cases in the history of the pandemic here in the United States, over 107,000 new cases. And there were 1,600 new deaths in the United States alone. Um, and we're rapidly approaching in the US 10 million cases of COVID. So the intersection of the election, um, the pandemic um, gives attention to a concept we introduced early in the course of biopolitics. Um, I was struck in an op-ed column this morning to read that in nine of the 10 most prevalent COVID states, um, Trump won the electoral votes in those states. So we're really living through a remarkable and incredibly difficult and disruptive time. And of course, when we do, this, also, this always reveals um, new problems for mental health and exacerbates older ones. One of the concepts that seems to come up quite a lot in our discussions is the nature of co-occurring epidemics or syndemics. And in our last class, we heard about the impact that COVID is having on rates of malaria in East Africa. And today I think we'll see that the epidemic of COVID both reveals and exacerbates and instigates um, fundamental problems of public health and especially public mental health. Um, the last concept I'll mention before I turn it over to Ingrid and today's guest faculty is one that Paul Farmer um, mentioned on Tuesday, which is the problem of nihilism, the perspective that the problems are so big and difficult that we can't do anything about them. And certainly we've seen a lot of nihilism in response to COVID-19. But the concept really applies very broadly to mental health problems here in the US and around the world. And perhaps in no area of those um, problems that create our overall burden of disease and suffering has nihilism been so significant and durable as it has for mental health issues long before COVID-19. And so I just wanted to suggest that the questions of what we can do about mental health, especially in the context of the pandemic, but the issues of stigma, the issues of isolation, the issues of a notion that we can't do anything has affected this area in such powerful ways over so many years. And I think today's speakers will make clear that we have a variety of incredibly powerful opportunities to improve mental health that we that have often suffered from the fundamental nihilism that is in many places affecting our response to COVID. So let me turn it over to Ingrid. We have three exceptional leaders in mental health, public health, um, care of the patient. So Ingrid. Thank you. So much, Alan. I I couldn't have said that better myself. And I think 
you know, this, this course, when Alan and I were thinking about this particular inflection point, we were um, somewhat purposeful in thinking about doing a section on a session on mental health right now, given what we knew would be a challenging time for many people in this moment. And I think really to speak to that nihilism, I think we have three phenomenal speakers today who have devoted their careers to countering that in a way and countering that narrative through their research, through their advocacy, through their work, through their leadership. And we're thrilled to have such exceptional speakers. So again, I can't do them any justice in a brief bio, but um, let me introduce you to our three phenomenal speakers today. Our first speaker is going to be Professor Shelley Greenfield, who is a professor of psychiatry at the Medi at Harvard Medical School, as well as the Christine Tr Trusty Endowed Chair of Psychiatry at McLean Hospital, where she also serves as the Chief Academic Officer. And Professor Greenfield's area is really focused primarily around addiction and substance use and abuse. And she's a clinician and a researcher, and she's really led a lot of the groundbreaking work around treatment for substance use disorders. And particularly, she's had a very strong focus on care for women with mental health issues. And I think this is a really critical um, area of intersection right now with an ongoing substance use and substance abuse um, challenge that we face in this country overlaid with COVID, overlaid with all of the stressors that come during this time. And so we're really excited to hear from Professor Greenfield today about how all of these epidemics are converging and how we can think more holistically about caring for populations and interventions that may be out there. So we're really thrilled um, to have Professor Greenfield with us today. Our second speaker is Professor Kimberlyn Leary who is Senior Vice President and, managing and manages research and program development for the Urban Institute in Washington, DC. And she came uh, to Urban from Harvard where she's an Associate Professor of Psychology at um, Harvard Medical School and Associate Professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Chan School of Public Health. She has really for years um, directed the program called Enabling Change um, for the Doctor of Public Health program at um, the Chan School and has served in many leadership roles across the university here and now at Urban. And she's had a particular focus on disparities and the lens that we need to be considering in terms of mental health across um, racial and ethnic groups. And really, again, an intersection of um, important social and cultural phenomena in our country. And so we're very excited to have um, Professor Leary with us today to really look at unpacking some of the mental health issues in particularly a focus of, in black and brown communities in the United States and how the epidemic has really impacted and affected fundamental persistent racial disparities in mental health. So we're thrilled to have her today. And our third speaker is Professor Vikram Patel, whom I, I imagine many of you know. He's the Pershing Square Professor of Global Health and the Wellcome Trust Principal Research Fellow in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at the Medical School and a professor in the TH Chan School of Public Health. And he's really a world leading researcher in global mental health, generating knowledge on the burden and determinants of mental health in low and middle income countries. And you know, to, to kind of take a, a bird's eye view, the, the idea of focusing on global mental health is something that you know, even 10 years ago was not um, fully on the radar screen of the global health community. And he has really been a pioneer in terms of getting this to the absolute apex of our focus because it's critical issue that, um, that he has really led in terms of both the epidemiology as well as intervention design. And his primary focus has been um, in India and I believe he will be heading back there soon to continue his um, critical work. So he is going to be giving us a global health perspective today. So really three phenomenal leaders. We're so thrilled to get to have them and we will um, start out with Professor Greenfield today. Thanks so much, Ingrid, and thank you for that um, generous introduction. I'm going to 
share my screen. So first of all, I just want to thank you for inviting me to speak uh, this morning to the class. I'm really happy to be here with you all um, today. And um, I know that um, this has been a stressful time uh, in so many different ways throughout all of 2020, leading up to and inclusive of today. And so I'm very happy to have a chance to talk to you. What I want to focus on today is on mental health and substance use in the United States during COVID-19. But I think what I really need to do first is talk to you about where we were at as of July 1 of 2020 and, and talk a little bit about the pre-pandemic um, era in terms of mental health. So mental illness and substance use disorders in the United States are highly prevalent. In 2019, more than 61 million Americans had a mental illness and or substance use disorder, which represented an increase of 5.9% over 2018. And these disorders, as you can see, are incredibly prevalent. And despite the consequences and the disease burden, the treatment gaps in the United States pre-pandemic were just vast. With 90% of all people with a substance use disorder in the United States in 2018 receiving no treatment, 57% of people with any mental illness in the United States in 2018 receiving no treatment, and more than half of adolescents with a depressive disorder in 2018 in the United States receiving no treatment. In addition to the high prevalence and this vast treatment gap, we also had three co-occurring epidemics or syndemics, that of suicide, that of alcohol-related disorders, and that of opioid use disorders inclusive of opioid overdose deaths. In fact, we were losing 70,000 people to, opioid, to overdose deaths in, in the United States every single year, most of those opioid overdose deaths, and those were continuing to be on the rise through the end of 2019. Simultaneously, in the United States, we had a silent epidemic of alcohol-related problems, silent because we weren't talking about it. In 2018, 14 million people, 18 and over, had an, a diagnosable alcohol use disorder, and that is not inclusive of people with alcohol, other types of alcohol problems, such as binge drinking or problem drinking. The 10 years prior to the pandemic, we had an increase in the intensity of binge drinking and alcohol-related emergency disorder, department visits and hospitalizations. Almost 90,000 people die annually from alcohol-related causes. Half of all liver deaths in the United States are attributable to alcohol misuse. And much to the shock and dismay of healthcare um, providers, there have been rising rates of alcohol-related liver disease in 15 to 39-year-olds in the, in the United States. And yet less than 10% of people with an alcohol disorder in the US receive any type of treatment for their alcohol problem. We also were having rising rates of suicide in the US over the last um, 10 to 15 years. In Massachusetts, where we consider our healthcare you know, excellent, we were not doing very well in this area compared to other states, inclusive of um, uh, lower scores on frequent mental distress, disparity in health status, drug deaths, and excessive drinking. In spite of our efforts to bend the curve in opioid overdoses in the US, you can see um, in 2017 through 2019, we had barely nudged the curve downward. And we were doing pretty poorly compared to the rest of the country in excessive drinking in Massachusetts, with an especial disparity here in females and in um, people with less than a high school education. And so we have had this just unbelievable longstanding disparity of mental health and substance use disorder care in the United States. It's among the greatest health disparities in the United States. Amongst the inclusive of the high prevalence of these disorders, as I said, we had these syndemics of opioid deaths and suicide. And the, the really perplexing and difficult problem for all of us is that we have evidence-based treatments for people with all of these disorders, but most people in the United States don't receive them. And it's really due to a chronic lack of a coordinated integrated treatments infrastructure. And I think we cannot deny that um, that is likely do very much and associated with longstanding stigma associated with these conditions. We also lack a trained multidisciplinary workforce. And in order to really meet the need, we really do need a multi-level linked and integrated health system. This is before the pandemic hit. And this is what we were talking about as a field before the pandemic is how to close this um, treatment prevalence gap in the US. And then in 2020, we had the pandemic 
begin. And we know now that during this COVID-19 era, every person in the United States, and, and, and I'm gonna talk specifically about the US because I know that Vikram will be speaking about um, global mental health in, in the time of the pandemic. Every person in the US has endured stress, some personal loss or trauma. There are very common experiences and concerns related to COVID-19 that people talk about all the time. And these include things like lost income, problems with childcare, isolation and quarantine, loss of normal coping and enjoyable activities, experiences of illness and death, housing and food insecurity, and people's emotions and worries, worries about their health, about the society, about this election, about getting sick, about um, what if someone in my family gets sick, and then experiences of anger and loneliness and grief and loss. And all of these have contributed to increases in um, various types of uh, mental health concerns. In fact, in the United States, and this is true of the US and around the world, in the United States, 33% of adults in, in June said that they had experienced stress, anxiety, or sadness that was difficult to cope with alone during the pandemic. The CDC about the same time said that the 40% of Americans during the pandemic had had at least one mental health condition and that these, this was three to four times the rate that they had seen 12 months prior. And 10% of people had reported consi seriously considering suicide in the past 30 days. And this was in June of 2020. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration said that their distress Disaster Distress Helpline received a 1,000% increase in calls compared to the same period. There have been increases in calls to domestic violence hotlines and overdose deaths have increased in the United States in some places as much as 25 to 50% compared to 2019. We know that depressive symptoms has also increased with a prevalence that's tripled as of June. And in particular, um, people with lower incomes lower social resources and increased stressors, we're at a higher risk for depression. And then the pandemic's really a setup for increase in alcohol use and misuse due to social isolation, stress and uncertainty and unemployment. And for those struggling with an alcohol or other substance use disorder, physical distancing poses a lot of challenges for treatment and recovery, even with telehealth options that are available to some. And we've seen evidence of increased drinking globally and in the United States among college students. One study in March sh showed that college students endorsing higher levels of stress and anxiety were especially at risk for increasing alcohol use, trying to cope um, with that stress and anxiety. In Australia, one study showed that Post-pandemic risk factors of job loss, stress, insomnia, and depression contributed to an increase in alcohol-related disorders. And in the United States, we've seen that psychological distress has actually in increased alcohol use, but especially true in females. So what can we do to meet this need? Well, one thing that was really just very striking in the United States was, then, was that when the public health emergency was declared in the middle of March, many regulatory barriers to um, extending telehealth for substance use and mental health melted away overnight. And this actually enabled people to begin to move care to telehealth. These were things that have been barriers for decades to um, uh, assisting people via telehealth for their mental health needs. At McLean, you can see on the left-hand side that all of our visits in our outpatient clinic um, were all in-person visits, those are the dark bars. And in January and February of 2020, all visits in the outpatient clinic were in-person. Once the telehealth barriers and regulatory framework changed, within two weeks, 14 days, all of visits in our outpatient clinic converted to telehealth. And you can see that all of them have continued with telehealth at the same and increased volumes. And by August, most of those were video visits. Now, I don't want people to think that telehealth is actually going to be a panacea. We have a digital divide in the United States. There are people who don't have access to devices and, and to telehealth. So it's not the only thing we can do, but it is one thing we can do. 
But there's another frame we can use, which is that of public health and community health. And one of them is, in, is prevention. And we know there are many things we can do to prevent. And that is we can help people increase their social supports, their economic supports. We can help people with their locus of control, including how they help themselves and care for themselves. We know that caring for yourself in terms of sleep and exercise and nutrition actually is um, one hedge you have for your mental health. And we can help people decrease their substance intakes to manage their stressors and to increase peer support. We also know that we need more screening for mental health in primary care and other services, seeing patients for a range of other uh, disorders, and that a mental health risk assessment within those services sectors will help us assess who is in need of treatment, whether they can be cared for in primary care or whether they need referral elsewhere. And finally, my last slide is I just want to say that there has been a just incredible appetite everywhere around the world and in the US for information about mental health. At McLean, one, one response we've had is to create webinars, um, educational webinars about mental health. 80 of these have been posted on the McLean website since the onset of the pandemic. As of August, 52,000 people from around the world have viewed these. 34 of these webinars were translated into English and Spanish. Others are available in other languages. And we've created other um, partnerships around the world to spread information about how people can help themselves with mental health around um, the, uh, uh, during this very stressful and difficult time. So I'm gonna stop there and um, thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Greenfield. I think um, just maybe two points to touch on before we pass it on to Professor Leary. I, I think, first of all, the concept of syndemics comes up a lot throughout this course. And I think um, you've really highlighted some of the critical pieces here for us when we think about these co-occurring epidemics in our country. And I think the second piece you raised, which is really interesting, is the fact that there were these barriers there to things like telemedicine that, as you said, just melted away. And so it makes one wonder how real those barriers needed to be in the first place. And, and what can we use this time for to consistently try to innovate, to care for our patients in um, other ways that may not have reached them, given all of also the caveats you mentioned about the digital divide. So thank you so much for that illuminating conversation. And we'll pass it over now to um, our second speaker. Hi, everybody. Uh, really very uh, happy to be here and to be part of this conversation. So uh, as uh, Ingrid mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist, but I've been spending a good part of my career over the last uh, many years at the intersection of both policy and practice. And in my role at the Urban Institute right now, I'm working across our 10 policy centers, housing, transportation, healthcare, job mobility. And I'm gonna talk about mental health in the context of multi-sector uh, policy uh, context. But first, let me speak as a clinical psychologist and just to pick up on a little bit of what Shelley mentioned. We're all uh, been in a state of chronic and largely unremitting stress for some time, especially over the last 48 hours, but really obviously for many, many months. And from my clinical training, which is psychoanalytic, uh, we say that stress becomes traumatic when people face events that are negative, uncontrollable, unpredictable, and require continuous adaptation. And that, of course, is a circumstance we've been in for many months. And a homegrown metaphor for this is you think about a coffee table. Maybe it's pretty sturdy and can hold the books and journals and uh, tchotchkes that you have on your table. But the more you load on that coffee table, the less robust it becomes. And for many, uh, that coffee table has become overloaded. And under ordinary circumstances, we might think of stress as a quite helpful signal. It tells you that you're in the midst of some danger. And typically, if you recognize that danger and you take protective action, your stress decreases. But that's not so with COVID-19, where some of the very public health measures that are designed to protect us from disease have exposed us to new stressors and new mental health challenges. And of course, it's worse for some of us. And that's what I'd like to speak about for a little bit. 
We know that communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by the health impacts of the pandemic. But as my colleagues at the Urban Institute have documented, Black and Latino people have been hardest hit by the stay at home orders and other public health measures. Because of a legacy of what we might call occupational segregation, it means that Black and Brown communities are overrepresented in low wage jobs and jobs that can't easily transition to remote work. And the layoffs that have been re related to COVID-19 also have hit black and brown communities uh, disproportionately, and they lead to housing instability. If you already have a high state of financial insecurity and a lower savings as a cushion, it's hard to weather the economic shocks uh, uh, now, uh, just as it was even before the pandemic. So when we think about mental health, you may think of it mostly as a dimension of health policy, but its impact is felt across all sectors. Think about the pressures facing a family uh, as they expect an eviction. We may not think of eviction first and foremost as a mental health issue, but we certainly recognize it has mental health impacts. Think about the tension in so many families right now, even in those families where adults can work from home and are busy trying to also serve as teachers for their little ones. With remote learning, which is a solution, mental health issues can surface due to the collective stress on individuals and families and on communities. We also know that racism is a specific stressor and links exist among racism, psychological distress, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder, particularly among Black people. And symptoms of anxiety and depression in non-Hispanic Black adults rose to 40.5% from May 28th to June 2nd. And they remain elevated, according to data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And in May, of course, Black people already traumatized by centuries of violence and brutality hit their breaking point when George Floyd was killed on camera and millions of allies joined in protest. And of course, all of this, the pandemic as a health crisis, the pandemic as an economic crisis, the pandemic as a racial reckoning crisis have are playing out right now while our democratic process and norms are being tested like never before. So these kinds of multiple concurrent overlapping and intersectional crises are what C.W. Churchman called a wicked problem, a complex problem where the forces affect and accelerate one another. And let me just say a little more about uh, the racial reckoning piece of this. You know, George Floyd's murder was just one of hundreds of instances of punitive policing and vigilante justice. Think of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and most recently, Walter Wallace, a psychiatric patient whose family called for help, but he was uh, gunned down by police because he was perceived uh, as a threat. But George Floyd became an inflection point. And I think it's really important to recognize that and to begin to think about why that may be and what the impact may be. My take, uh, not unique to me, but is that Americans are moved to action by, by the particular and on behalf of specific injustices, especially those that they can see. And George Floyd's death occurred on camera where for eight minutes and 46 seconds, we watched a man be suffocated to death. Possibly his death by suffocation at a time when we are all attuned to the horrors of the loss of breath at COVID touched us more personally because we felt more collectively vulnerable. Now, what happened as a result of that inflection point, of course, is that more Americans became willing to see that officer involved deaths of unarmed black people reflected entrenched structural racism and we also began to see that in the context of who is affected and who is dying from COVID-19. And so structural racism became what we might think of as a collective problem, no longer a problem out there in someone else's community, but my problem in my community. And that instituted, I would say, a, a tremendous amount of activity, of innovation. If we got online in uh, two weeks, 
in with mental health virtual visits, we got in line, if you will, with structural racism as hundreds of US firms, nonprofit organizations and universities made public statements that they would become anti-racist. And many have pledged considerable capital to doing that. Now, the more cynical among us might uh, greet this sudden commitment to racial equity with some skepticism, but there really is no greater indication of success of this mass movement than the pushback that has happened. Think about uh, the current president's executive order, uh, which is ostensibly about combating sex and race stereotyping. It's also pretty clear that it's an effort to make it very costly for federal agencies and federal contractors to grapple openly and honestly with the structural racism that is now collectively our problem. Now, part of what I do in my work at the Kennedy School, and I'm also a lecturer in public policy at the Kennedy School, is that I work with elected leaders around um, seminars and courses and working groups where we, we try to help them to think about their own leadership in different ways. Clearly they're in real time managing multiple crises, but we try to give them a space so that they can think about what they're being asked to do at this particular moment. So this may be a follow on to the nihilism that Professor Farmer mentioned. You know, go back to this definition of wicked problems. Well, anything like what we're seeing right now uh, with COVID-19, an economic crisis, a social justice crisis, a democracy crisis, leaves communities disoriented. And it's difficult to lead people when they are scared and disoriented. So to be relevant, what leaders need to do is they have to help their communities cultivate a sense of situational awareness. And they have to prepare people to make difficult choices on competing priorities. So in sessions with public leaders, uh, especially through the uh, Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative, we've spent the last few months responding to mayor's questions about community mental health and helping them to understand and address stress. And I wanna just uh, close with two points about this. This has meant helping people in elected leadership roles recognize that the very protective tactics that they were trying to um, make sure their communities would follow simultaneously brought new stresses and to be sensitive to that. We tried to assist them to think about the impact of COVID-19 and those stresses on those with known mental health issues and disabilities and to be sensitive to the trauma of frontline workers, which included bus drivers and people working in stores, not just doctors and nurses. And finally, we had many sessions with them where we counseled them on how to engage publicly as grievers in chief and to do the unimaginable, to try to console whole communities at the same time that those communities and families didn't have the usual resources and rituals to help them to grieve. So that's an overview of some of the things that I've been working on with my colleagues at the Urban Institute and closer to home at the Bloomberg Harvard uh, City Leadership Initiative. And I'll pass things uh, back to Ingrid. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Leary. I, um, I'm so moved by the concept of grievers in chief and the idea that you can really begin to unpack some of these issues at very much at the community level. And I think the need to address the intersectionality of these concurring factors of racism, of um, structural and social inequalities that overlap with this moment with COVID is so critical. And I love the idea of having a, the grievers in chief, which is certainly not a normative um, model of leadership that we have seen and yet such a critical one during this moment. So thank you for your work and for your leadership here. I'm going to pass it now to Professor Patel. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, well, I'm going to actually, I've, I've, I've been thinking about how to present my remarks uh, to follow on from these two fabulous uh, uh, presentations. And so uh, I'm going to maybe um, start off by saying that my remit was to really bring a global uh, picture into the conversation today. And what I'm going to suggest to you today is that everything that Shelley 
uh, uh, and Kim have presented also applies just as much to any other part of the world. In fact, in some instances, certain uh, issues are amplified, but also on the converse, there are certain areas of, uh, for example, the social mechanisms of protecting people from mental health problems that might operate in different ways in different places. I can't cover the whole world and all this incredible diversity in 10 minutes, but except to recognize that some of the factors that uh, Shelley spoke to about uh, what's affecting all of our mental health. And I think I, I, I would sort of, you know, combine all of this into saying the biggest, uh, biggest factor of all is the uncertainty uh, of not knowing where many of the things that I've shown on this slide uh, um, uh, are going to return back to normal. Indeed, in some instances, in fact, they look like they're going to get a lot worse before they in fact get any better. Uh, I think the important point to make um, from the global context is that the vast majority of the world's population lives in societies in which there is very little governmental action uh, to actually protect people uh, from some of these stressors. Indeed, perhaps one could argue the US is also very similar in that respect. But I contrast that, for example, from Western Europe. In Britain, for example, most people who were asked to stay at home got 80% of their salaries paid for by the state. And that's an example of a very practical social policy uh, uh, intervention, uh, which governments were taking while they were asking people to stay at home to protect the community from the spread of the COVID. They were also recognizing simultaneously what that would mean in terms of the psychosocial consequences, economic consequences of staying at home, and they were preparing for it. But unfortunately, the vast majority of the world's people do not live in societies uh, which are either adequately well resourced enough to do that, but I think far more important in resources is having a moral imperative to actually ensure that the damaging effects of the containment of the epidemic uh, is, is, is going to actually uh, uh, be, uh, be, be, be buffered. It's important for me to recognize this and to, to make this point, which is that the virus's direct effect on our mental health is actually quite minimal. There's no doubt there are some emerging um, uh, uh, findings suggesting that some individuals uh, do develop long-term cognitive uh, deficits. This is something that we've seen with many viral conditions. Um, you know, what's really damaging isn't actually the virus itself, but the impact the virus has had uh, on our personal health, on bereavement, on loss, but mostly actually the containment policies uh, that uh, we've seen affecting, for example, access to schooling, college education, jobs, and so on. It's important also, and this follows on from, uh, uh, from Kim's uh, uh, presentation, really, that people aren't affected similarly across the population. And of course, I think we're all familiar with the fact that uh, historic disadvantages and inequities uh, will be amplified, in fact, uh, in many ways. It's interesting, Shelley rightly pointed out that, you know, there's been this huge uh, sense of, uh, 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 of opportunity for digital uh, uh, delivery of all kinds of things, from education, as we're doing right now, uh, to healthcare. But let's not, let's, let's not you know, fool ourselves uh, into thinking that everyone has access either to the right technologies, the right bandwidth, uh, um, the computer devices, but most importantly, the space uh, to actually be able to have uh, the kind of um, uh, you know private uh, you know sheltered space in which one can fully engage with, for example, a class or with healthcare, um, and I think you will also see the other groups here that are in, in very important, and I really would like to highlight the two groups at the bottom, people with serious enduring mental health problems whose healthcare has been disrupted, and now we have very good evidence from a large study in the US um, showing with I think something like 60 million plus uh, individuals uh, or, or, or health records uh, showing that the people with serious mental illness had uh, much worse outcomes in the last six months uh, um, in terms of both in uh, contracting COVID-19 but also dying as a result of comorbidities. The other big group of course which include almost the entire class here would be young people who, as, as I often describe uh, in other talks, have been thrown under the bus uh, by, by the pandemic and mostly by the policies uh, to control the pandemic. Now, there's very little empirical data that's come from the global uh, south, uh, and this paper was published, as you can see, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, which I thought was worth bringing up uh, uh, to this class, mainly because it's the only and the largest uh, population-based study that I've seen emerge from a low or middle-income country, and I've just pulled out uh, the, the, the main findings. This is also not a classically a population study because it was based on a social media sample, which is already quite biased. Nevertheless, it was a large sample. It did cover the whole of Bangladesh. 
And you can see here very high prevalences of depression, suicidal ideation, but also you can see that uh, there's a disproportionate distribution in the, in the population, uh, particularly with women and young people uh, being at much higher risk. And of course, the rates are highest where the uh, COVID-19 itself was, uh, uh, had the highest prevalence. What does the future hold? I think it's important for, for, to recognize that, you know, we're really in the midst of the pandemic right now. Uh, and, you know, and in different parts of the world are in different stages uh, of the pandemic. But it would be fair to say, as a, uh, if we look at the world as a whole, uh, that the world is still mired in the middle of uh, a disease that continues to spread in many parts of the world. Um, and so we really have to look beyond the current uh, uh, you know, high, heightened level of anxiety, which I think to a large extent could be seen I think, as, as, as was, was mentioned earlier, in a very normative way, as the, as the reaction of the human mind uh, uh, to an extraordinary uh, set of circumstances and uncertainties. But it's the future that I think we should also be thinking about. And I think uh, 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 Shelley already spoke to this. Uh, you know, this, this, this book by Angus Deaton and Anne Case, uh, uh, you know, economists at Princeton University, documents what happened after the last financial crisis, which was a very local crisis, actually. It was predominantly seen only in the US. And I think it's, it's important to say this because the rest of the world was able to pull the US out much quicker than I think this potential crisis will. Uh, because uh, uh, the whole world has been very badly affected. And of course, there's a lot else going on, which is also going to, um, you know, geopolitically, uh, that is also going to perhaps uh, threaten a recovery uh, as quickly as the previous crisis uh, 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 was followed. And, and obviously, uh, the, uh, much of the, the deaths as, uh, as a case and Deaton document was driven by mental health issues, uh, not least substance use. Now, I'm not going to say anything about the situation before COVID because uh, Shelley, Shelley described it really well, except to say that just last month, a, a very important paper came out, which I think is germane to the, the, the comments I'm going to make uh, uh, in the second part of my remarks, which is about transforming our, our thinking about mental health care. This is a, a, a study that comes from the World Mental Health Survey led by Ron Kessler at the medical school. And what it really shows is for people with depression, what was the effective coverage of care in low and middle income countries? And you can see only about a quarter of people actually sought care um, in contrast to 50% that, that, that Shelley presented from the US. But if you looked at the effectiveness of that care, it was less than, less than 10%. It was, so in effect, you could say that about 5% of people with depression in the global south actually received effective care, making this, in my mind, perhaps the largest unmet need for quality care for any health condition in the world. Now, you think the US, for example, let me give you, a, 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 you know, the, 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 the rich world has countless more resources for mental health care. You know, for example, there are more psychiatrists from Nigerian, Ghanaian, uh, Ethiopian, uh, Indian, Sri Lankan origin practicing in the US than there are in their native countries. And actually, I could say this for virtually every African uh, and most South Asian countries. Do so you think with all these extra resources that there should be a much more dramatic uh, set of results for coverage in high income countries. And of course, you do see a much higher level of coverage. 50% is pretty good, actually, compared to what we saw, saw on the earlier slide. It's about double. But look at the, the, the proportion of people who get effective care. It's still actually probably just around 10%. And you, you have to ask yourself the question, uh, this, this, very, this, this model of care, which really what, what, what is dominated by a very biomedical focus on mental disorders, and, and, and specialized models of delivery of care, if this is what you can achieve in spite of spending a thousand fold more uh, than you do in Africa and Asia, this is the, this is the quantum of, of, of improvement. Clearly, we have to reimagine what mental health care can look like. And that's where the opportunity comes from the Global South. About a decade ago, in 2010, um, uh, then director of the National Institutes for Mental Health invited me and Pamela Collins to co-chair uh, a priority setting exercise that really sought to uh, uh, identify the key research questions that if addressed would significantly contribute to the reduction in the global burden of suffering for mental health problems. And perhaps not surprisingly, the leading questions were to do better with the knowledge we already had on both prevention as well as care. The leading questions were not, let's discover the next gene or the next molecule uh, or the next neural circuit. It was actually, let's do better with knowledge we've had in some instances for 40 or 50 years that we have singularly failed uh, to, uh, to, to translate into population impact. And thanks to what I, my back of the envelope calculation suggests that, you know, more than half a billion dollars 
has now been spent on, on backing these grand challenges. It will be fair for me to conclude 10 years later that we now know how to deliver mental health interventions, both preventative and clinical, in any resource setting. And it's important for me to emphasize this in any resource setting. And what this has enabled us to do is to reimagine what we mean by resources. In the past, when we said we needed resources, the issue of nihilism that, that, that Alan spoke to was that we don't have enough mental health specialists. We don't have enough mental health resources. But what this particular body of evidence makes us think about is if every community has a resource, and that is people who have a calling to care for one another, how do we actually engage and leverage existing resources in every community to be involved with this very important work? And that, of course, completely changes the conversation about what we mean uh, by resources. This body of evidence has transformed mental health care in many ways uh, by redefining what comprises mental health care. I won't go into any details because perhaps this is something we can do in the discussion, where mental health care can be provided, who is a mental health provider, it could be anyone really uh, in the community, uh, and, and how mental health care is delivered, of course, in a coordinated way because one size does not fit all. And the idea really here is this is evidence is building the foundation of the mental health care system that has been missing in virtually all countries of the world, no matter how wealthy or, uh, or, or resourced they are. Ten years ago, if I had told you that this idea of using community-based workers to deliver mental health care uh, is, is, is something we should recommend, I would have been laughed out because there was no science to back it. Today, it's in, fa in fact um, uh, recommended now by the World Bank, the World Health Organization, and many national uh, organizations. And I will turn to this, the most exciting uh, uh, you know, impact has been here in the US where uh, the work that's been done in the least resourced countries of the world is now influencing policy and practice in this country. A few years ago, uh, recognizing this, uh, this evidence, uh, uh, this, this, this really, I think, this, this very exciting global health evidence, um, Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, uh, invited me to assemble a group of uh, uh, 28 people from around the world to really uh, uh, distill what does this evidence tell us about the future of mental health care. Uh, you can access this issue um, uh, from The Lancet, but I'm just going to finish with some key messages that I think uh, hopefully might stir up some discussion. The first is we've got to look beyond the binary. In our effort for, for psychiatry and, 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 and all the other clinical mental health disciplines to be seen and recognized and accepted as a, uh, as, as a legitimate discipline of medicine, I think what we've done is we've, we've artificially created binary diagnostic boxes which don't reflect actually the way mental health problems are experienced either by the community or indeed how neuroscience uh, uh, conceptualizes mental health issues. Um, you know, it's easy for us to, to separate people with and without COVID-19 into two different boxes using a PCR test, but it is impossible actually to do that in any kind of objective way uh, for mental health problems. And we do therefore need to look at the dimensional spectral nature of mental health experiences. And what that then enables us to do is to think about prevention, uh, particularly through actions that target early childhood and adolescent uh, structural and social determinants, because that's when most mental health problems begin. <laughs> This is a really important piece, which we haven't talked about much, uh, except when, uh, when Kim talked about the, the killing uh, of the young man with a bipolar disorder last week. Uh, it reminds me, actually, of, of, of the huge, huge gaps in the quality of care that people with serious mental illness experience, which in turn, of course, often means uh, that uh, their conditions worsen very precipitously and often lead to police intervening rather than a healthcare system intervening. Um, and finally, uh, you know, we do need to recognize the power of psychosocial interventions uh, and, of course, the enormous evidence that allows us to scale these up through community-based workers. I want to end by telling you about an exciting initiative that Global Mental Health at Harvard has launched, which is to really translate the last of those recommendations to scale uh, by building a digital platform that can enable people, uh, frontline workers, to learn how to deliver interventions that are evidence-based to then master the delivery of those interventions uh, and to then enable systems to, to monitor the impact of those interventions. A suite of digital tools, which we've already begun to test in India, thanks to NIH support to scale up a brief behavioral activation treatment for depression. Uh, this is just showing you our partner organization in India's uh, uh, work on, on digitizing the curriculum for learning this treatment for frontline workers. But here's the really exciting thing I end with, which is that we're actually um, now doing this 
in Texas, here in the US. Uh, with the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute, perhaps the first time where a intervention that was designed, developed, evaluated, and delivered in a very low resource setting in the hands of community health workers has been embraced for delivery in the US. And really what's exciting for me is that the American Psychological Association, a professional guild that you think might actually have a lot of pushback to this idea, has actually joined us as a knowledge partner to ensure that the curriculum is consistent uh, with American context. And this is some other interventions we're developing. And so I want to just end with this slide that we really do need to reframe mental health as a global public good, not just as a biomedical condition with diagnoses and disorders and, tr and, and treatments, but really as a universal human quality. Perhaps the single most important asset that each of us has is in fact our mental health. Um, it's indivisible from other aspects of our health. It's important to everyone in all countries, but especially so, and I hope we have a discussion on this, it's especially important to young people, uh, and it's never been as important as it is today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vikram. That was really fantastic. I wanna thank all three of our speakers for these really outstanding presentations. It occurs to me that they are fundamentally integrated, even though each of you selected particular areas or problems to center attention on. And I just thought in, in a sort of brief comment, one of the things that Dr. Patel said in his talk is that these traditional ways that we organize medical, public health, and social knowledge really are not functioning at all. And the deep division that we traditionally and historically have seen between talking about physical health and mental health are really in some ways exacerbated by the pandemic and revealed for their limitations. Because one of the things we know is that stress, racism, oppression, all have fundamental impacts on mental health. But of course, those mental health impacts have fundamental impacts on the body and on other patterns of disability and disease. So I think this has been an especially rich discussion because on the one hand, we identify a lot of these things in the mental health domain, but they have such profound implications for all of health. The other thing I wanted to mention was one of the things that the presentation show is that, you know, the strategies of containing the pandemic have been very harmful to people from the point of view of stress, psychiatric vulnerability, pre-existing social problems, the problems of disparities, poverty, food and nutrition, vulnerability in the workforce. And I do find that this is one of the most complicated issues as we look forward, that as Dr. Leary said, this is a wicked problem and controlling one can exacerbate the other. And regrettably, much as we pose the dichotomy of mental health and physical health, we've been in a system where we have talked about lockdowns or opening as if they are two totally different perspectives on response to the pandemic. So I guess my question for all three of you is this, is as we look forward and the pandemic is really at a height now, and we have no expectation, I would say, even with vaccines and treatment, that we are going to be free of COVID anytime soon. Are there strategies that the mental health perspective offers for thinking more sharply about how to respond to the pandemic and at the same time address fundamental mental health needs and develop um, supportive situations where people will not be so vulnerable. And I think this has been one of the trade-offs. It's been poorly um, captured in the media and in public health, but the psychosocial issues of the pandemic are phenomenally important. And if we can't figure out strategies to address them in concert with protecting people from COVID, we'll continue to 
ping pong back and forth between policy proposals that both introduce fundamental problems for health and for mental health. So I don't know if any of the three of you want to comment on that, but um, this is just one thought before we go to our students' questions. Are you um, asking about, uh, I think the question is a great question. And I guess, you know, if I were to just take a stab at what is a critical question for us, I would say that three major things we know can help people during incredibly stressful times, during traumatic times. And that includes social support, caring for the self, and financial support. And we know that there are these incredible economic stressors and um, both uh, Dr. Leary, Dr. Patel talked about financial stressors and how those have played out and how in other countries, for example, when people did not have to lose 100% of their income, that actually was a major contributing protective factor. In the United States, a giant stimulus package that would cover people who lose, lose jobs and um, so that they don't have to worry about losing their housing and their food. That is a major uh, place where we can go. And that's that we think of that as financial, but that's not just financial. That's a health issue, both, you know, a full health issue, including mental health. And then I think these issues around how do we help people care for themselves um, and I really mentioned food and nutrition and exercise, the things that you actually can try to do for yourself to take care of yourself and the people in your family. And then finally, social support. And again, I think to um, Vikram's um, discussion, there's a lot that can be done you know, um, in communities in terms of social support. And these things are prevalent in some parts of the world and some communities and really not and really absent in others. And people have just varying degrees of social support, but that is a giant hedge against trauma and stress. So those are three big things we can do, three big things we can do um, everywhere. And, I'm, I, and in the United States, you know, um, what we understand, I think from what I was trying to say about the melting away of the barriers is it's a lot about political will. It's a lot about political will. And um, when there is political will, we saw overnight barriers that had always been erected to doing certain things, just overnight, they went away because there was political will to make them disappear and they did. So a lot of these things are about the political will to do what's necessary. And so I would stop there. Yes, I would say, um in addition to what Shelley has um, laid out so beautifully, is that um, for people in uh, leadership roles or in positions of authority, you know, their communities are looking to them for uh, answers, even when answers aren't available. They're looking for guidance. They're looking for protection. And it can be tremendously seductive to try to provide people even a modicum of a false cure. Um, so I think that um, one of the uh, challenges for, for people in leadership roles is to learn the art of speaking about competing priorities in, in realistic ways and, not, and remembering that not everyone has the same resources uh, for self-care. Uh, and so uh, you, know, you can imagine if you're on the receiving end of certain forms of advice, um, it, it, it rings hollow and it makes you distrust those who are giving you advice uh, about your health or your community's health. So the messaging here that uh, it is so critical to managing under crisis, I think deserves our attention of messages that are honest and help communities to, to recognize that this is a hard slog we do not know when uh, there will be anything approaching relief and it's not gonna come equally to all members of that community. That's a political reality in the absence of the kind of political well, will that Shelley described that is really critical, but very difficult for most political leaders to take up. 
So I just wanted to say one thing on a slightly separate. I, I agree with everything that Shelley and Kimberly have, have just said, and so I don't want to duplicate that. But I wanted to actually ask a more provocative question, Alan, in response to your, your remark. And it is a responsibility of the public health um, academic community. Let's, let me put, put it this way, because we, we are in a university that has many, many different disciplines. Um, and I think, uh, well, every discipline really that matters. And I think the question for us is, is a pandemic a biomedical event? Uh, or is it a solely a biomedical event? And I think obviously that's a rhetorical question. I don't believe it is. If uh, anyone had to see the impact of the lockdown in India, you will know that the catastrophic human cost uh, of not of the pandemic, by the way, but of this government policy um, uh, was, um, it was far more devastating than the pandemic is. And I think it's a false dichotomy of lives and livelihoods, a completely false dichotomy. And I think we've been pushed into this, this corner in part, I would believe, and this is certainly from my reading in India, which is where I, where I was locked down actually, and I was on my way to Boston and I couldn't get out um, because of the lockdown, was because of a singular focus of the public health scientific community on COVID-19. It was like seeing the world through a, 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 a tunnel, you know, rolling up a piece of paper and just seeing the whole world through just one focus. It's absolutely correct that at that time, no one could have predicted what the actual trajectory of the pandemic would have been. No one could have, because these are you know, essentially unknowables and mathematical models are helpful in predicting some of those unknowables. But everyone could have predicted with precise, very pre with great precision, how many people would go hungry the next day. And the reason you could predict that was because you know through economic surveys, how many people have day wage jobs. Uh, and so for a government, to actually impose a lockdown knowing that 80% of your population would go hungry the very next day, I think is immoral. The question for us is, to what extent does that responsibility lie on our community to be able to see the full picture so that when we go and inform a government that this is what you should do to control COVID, we also say that you're gonna to have to also simultaneously and not wait for some catastrophe, simultaneously have you know, uh, conditional cash transfers, income support, food kitchens, um, reaching out to the, the, those who are gonna be badly affected, consider young people as, 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 as a really important group. To what extent have, have our community fulfilled that obligation to present the full picture? And I'll end by saying, you know, in, in a lot of my writing in India, I've often said the real problem with India's COVID-19 strategy has been the absence of social scientists in the conversation. The whole thing has been hijacked by medical doctors when we've always known a pandemic is a social phenomenon. Yeah, well, these are really great responses. I guess I would say, you know, as you suggest, we frame a pandemic in very strictly biomedical terms. What's the organism? Can we find it in the body? Can we figure out ways to destroy it or develop immunological responses against it? And what we have found in this period, while we search for those tools, is that fundamentally the pandemic is social and political. And so it makes it very difficult to deal with because the frameworks and the traditions and the interests really are centered in conceiving of this in a narrow biomedical way. And I think when we look at the mental health issues and the mental health suffering that have been um, you know, made so clear through the pandemic, we realize that you know, I've, been, I've been avoiding the term pre-existing because it makes it sound like it's a biomedical thing. Like, well, I had this before I got insurance or I couldn't get insurance because I had this condition. And pre-existing is the character of social inequalities in a profound way. The question that really comes up in all three presentations is how can you, you know, reconfigure this? How can you reframe it in some way? And we've seen other presentations in the course, you know, contact tracing is a biomedical phenomenon but the way it's been conceived by our colleagues and partners in health is a community engagement phenomenon. So how do we begin to reconfigure these things? It, these are just profoundly important questions. And you know, like so many things that we've been discussing in the course, the epidemic illuminates 
the world as it is that is often not visible until you have the pandemic. And you know, we have been able to see so many profound untreated, under-resourced problems in this context, you know, at this time. So let, we have students who would like to get in. So um, we sure again. do. Uh, beginning with the one, the only, I'm starting to think of him as one of our course mascots. I, I was just wondering, um, in resource limited settings, like what strategies do community health workers actually enact to help people who have like multiple stressors that cannot be easily fixed, such as like food, employment, and health issues that are affecting their mental health? So I think, uh, you know, in response to that question, and there are low resource settings in the U.S. as well. So let's let, let's be very clear that actually the uh, the question can be answered by both Shelley and, and Kimberly as well. So, but speaking from my work in India and also with colleagues in Africa, community health workers have very little agency directly to address the social and structural determinants right now. They're still very much working in a highly biomedical system. Uh, and so within the context of the mental health interventions, the packages of care they deliver address primarily their clinical distress. Clinical by clinical, I mean the psychological symptoms of distress. Uh, but almost all of these interventions include a recognition of the social determinants and at the very least health workers will be able to help the person they're working with to navigate to where they can actually find, um, uh, uh, you know, for example, income support is beyond the, the realm of a community health worker or, you know, um, uh, so it's for that, the real most important resource the health worker has is information and guidance to support the person to actually access those existing resources where, where, where they're available. In the US, there's been a lot of research um, to, to Vikram's point in um, care navigators, and in particular in the addiction world, um, care navigators who help people manage the care system and, and help them get the resources that they need. Sometimes those are getting insurance um, so that they can get their conditions treated. Sometimes it's helping them find the best uh, you know, clinical treatment that they need. Sometimes it's finding peers in the community who can support their recovery. So um, there's evidence to show that, you know, navigators um, in the US have helped in many, many different communities, um, you know, across the country. It's a great question, actually, great question. And I would just add um, uh, to Shelley's point uh, in the substance abuse treatment world, those who have lived experience uh, are particularly effective um, peer uh, colleagues. But the same is the case in, 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 in other areas as well. You know, I think at a moment like this, when you know, there aren't answers, at least they're not the kind of answers that we would like whole cloth, the experience of being seen and heard by someone who has the time to take in your story and help you problem solve as best they can, doesn't solve the problem, but it makes it more possible to bear in certain ways. Uh, in addition to uh, the fact that there's a lot of expertise on the ground that people who are in more official roles may not know about. So uh, we wanna also recognize that that peer support is about garnering expertise on the ground uh, that's often known to people in the community and not to those who are outside of the community. Uh, and following up, uh... Would any of the speakers be able to comment on challenges of distributing mental health to communities that have an attitude of grit your teeth and bear it versus maybe the more American talk it out attitude? I think the student meant to add, from my own experience, many immigrant communities uh, prefer the former rather than the latter. There are a number of us, I think, who could comment on this. And uh, Vikram, I see you poised and I'll yield to you and, and comment. Yeah. I think that's just an incredibly critical, important question. And I think, you know, we often talk about meeting people where they are and helping them um, talk through where, you know, what, what is appropriate and helpful to them based on their perspective. 
and weighing out where they are at the moment and where they'd like to be, um, what, what their own goals are and how those might be best achieved within their own context and their own culture. And that can be a way to assist people in thinking through their own agency about what they would wish to do to manage a problem that they are you know, perceiving either in themselves or someone in the family. Um, and it is one approach to helping people who come from a different perspective and, and um, uh, an approach both could be a familial one or could be um, part and parcel of the culture in which they grew up. It can also be a generational one, but finding the place where the person actually is and where they would wish to find themselves and helping them do that walk in ways that are acceptable to them is, is one way that we sometimes think about assisting people in, in, in accomplishing what they would like to accomplish in their own lives. So just to build on that, I think, um, you know, what, one of the things I've seen in my work uh, in the Global South is that one reason why people have those attitudes is because they are reluctant to conceptualize their experiences in a biomedical way. Because if it is the case that when you say you need to actually, you know, it, it, because often mental health and mental illness are conflated, right? So when you say, I have a problem with my mental health, for many, many people, uh, there are historic uh, uh, narratives. That means you need to see a psychiatrist, uh, which in many parts of the world suggests you're crazy, um, you know, and you might be put on a medication that will make you drowsy, et cetera, et cetera. It's a whole set of sort of historic experiences that, 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 that are, in, you know, in, part and parcel of that conversation. They're implicit in that conversation. So that is why I think a lot of people say, listen, just get, get on with it, you know, talk to someone. On the other hand, if we do embrace a non-binary approach uh, to mental health uh, and recognize that, you know, mental health is like physical health, you know, it, just because you get a little pain in your chest, it doesn't mean you go rushing to a cardiologist, but the first thing you might possibly do is talk to your partner at home and say, hey, listen, I'm getting a little bit odd pain in my chest or speak to a friend, a neighbor, etc." If we were able to normalize those conversations by avoiding this automatic implicit idea that when you talk about your mental health, it means you might be crazy. Um, I think that is the goal that we need to achieve in all places. And I think that will help a lot in people being able to talk about mental health distress without necessarily it being medicalized. I would also just mention that uh, there can be an assumption uh, that, we, that, that communities understand either the affirmative or negative aspects of mental health treatment when they may not. And even when people have access to care, um, there can be a gulf between the way the practitioner expects that care to go and to unfold and the very real questions of respect and preference that individual families or persons may have. So I think um, the, the, there, there's a pretty broad uh, array of help that's out there, formal, informal, and even within formal mental health, health uh, care systems, different approaches. So I guess I would say that maybe in line with our general comment about uh, let's stop thinking in binaries, let's mental health care is either you formal mental health care, you, you do it or you don't, but begin to look at the varieties of opportunities that are possible even in a COVID inflict inflected world. I just wanna thank our speakers. Unfortunately, we're right at the edge of our time, but we could ask you so many more questions and I think, you know, again, this just speaks to the critical need to have all of these diverse voices at the table when we're thinking about a public health response to a pandemic like this, that it cannot be driven by a singular voice by any means. And I kept thinking during this conversation about um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and that if we're not meeting people's needs at the bottom of this period, there is absolutely no way that they can be um, anywhere near the top of um, self-actualization. And in this context, I, it strikes me around many things that you said, that there are so many basic factors that families and individuals are not able to access. And certainly mental health care is one of the most critical. And so I really wanna thank you all, not just for uncovering um, the challenges that are faced 
but also for the work that you continue to do to lead interventions um, and, and responses globally. I think this moment is more critical than ever. And I hope that as a community, we can lift you all up to continue to do this important work that has been needed before COVID and is needed now more than ever. So thank you all for your continued work and leadership. And thanks to everyone for coming today. Stay safe and we will see you next week. Thank you so much. Just great.